That's fine. Oh, I have to let people in though, don't I? Oh, you can? Oh, nice. To remember to stop the video. Oh, and I have to open up my phone. And I just hit share screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's 12 people in here already. Am I muted? No. Hi everyone, uh, I'm the Curator of Collections and Exhibitions here at the Geneva History Museum um, and I am going to give our virtual public art tour today. So. Okay. All right. So today I'm going to walk you through our art tour and hopefully shed light on some pieces throughout Geneva that you may or may not be familiar with. Whether they're sculptures, murals, or statues, the sidewalks, lawns, and buildings of Geneva are home to notable pieces of public art, all of which add to Geneva's already unique personality. The sign above, one of three around town, was created for the city by local artist Joseph Ganpen and shows just how much Geneva appreciates art that we place it at the forefront of our city. The first stop of our tour is on the south wall of the alley at 121 South 3rd Street, just next to the museum. This mosaic tile mural was commissioned by the Fox Valley Jewish Neighbors to commemorate their 10th anniversary in 2016. The mural was designed by artist Daniel Dobies, based on drawings by children and ideas from FBJN members. Funded by the Geneva Foundation for the Arts, the six panels include symbols of peace, diversity, education, 
family and ancestry, the sharing of celebrations and appreciation of the natural and man-made beauty and resources. Next, we'll go across the street to the King County Courthouse. The King County Soldiers and Sailors Monument at the front of the courthouse was unveiled in 1915 at a cost of 25,000 to honor the King County residents who served in the Mexican, Civil, and Spanish-American Wars. While the entire structure was constructed by W. Cummings, Carl Augustus Heber sculpted the main statue at the top and the eagles on the sides. Heber grew up in King County and studied at the Art Institute of Chicago. He then worked for noted sculptor Laredo Taft and later displayed his art at the World Columbian Exposition of 1893. The statue on top shows a standing soldier holding a flag with both hands, who is flanked by a kneeling rifleman on his left and a kneeling drummer on his right. Two eagles with their wings spread sit on the sides of the base, which is composed of marble. 22 bronze plaques surround the base and include the names of over 5,000 King County veterans who were honorably discharged from the service. A small plaque in the front of the monument marks the spot where the then Senator John F. Kennedy gave a speech during his presidential campaign on October 25, 1960. Just behind the monument is a ball and chain from the Andersonville prisoner of war camp. Two naval guns sit just behind and on either side of the statue. These were used during World War I and were donated by the US government in 1925. For our next stop, we'll move inside the courthouse, where on the fourth floor are 11 oil on canvas murals set with an oak line arches. The murals were painted by Aurora artist, Edward Holslag in 1910. These murals depict different scenes of each of the King County townships in 1892, the year the courthouse was built. Holslag was appointed superintendent of decoration for the Library of Congress in Washington, DC at the age of 22. The mural above depicts a scene in Campton. So next we'll move behind the King County Courthouse and we'll see the Casa King County Grow a Healthy Child Garden. The garden was created to raise funds to serve the needs of abused and neglected children. Casa does this by inviting community members to name a brick or granite paver bench or statue within the garden. This sculpture of a young child stands in the center of the garden. Design and installation management was, con was conducted by landscape architect Jenna Anderson in 2012. Next at the southwest corner of 3rd and James Streets is the Dalla Hitching Post. The Geneva Cultural Arts Commission or GCAC began the Bike Plus Rack Equals Art Functional Sculptures Program in 2014 to purchase and install select artistic bike rack designs to promote more artwork throughout downtown Geneva. This bike rack features three five foot high stainless steel Swedish Dalla horses by Batavia resident Eric Fuertes. The Dalla horses are the symbol for Geneva's annual summer festival, Swedish Days. The sculpture was dedicated in honor of Jean Gaines, who served as chamber president from 1978 to 2018. Next, we'll go inside the Geneva Post Office. On the south wall, just to the left when you enter, is Fish Fry in the Park. This mural was painted by artist Manuel Bromberg in 1940 as part of a New Deal program during President Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration. Artists were instructed consult to consult with local residents and postmasters, and then paint about things they know and have looked at often and touched and loved to boost the morale of the country during the Great Depression. This mural depicts a scene in Geneva's Island Park. It is one of three post office murals painted by Bromberg, who actually turned 104 in March. And my personal favorite part of this mural is the little cat-like creature below the table at the forefront. Next, we'll go over to the Geneva Chamber of Commerce, just a few doors down, to visit the Chamber Tree. This large mural sits on the south wall of the Visitor Center. This is another piece of Joseph Gunpan's works. Now we'll move across the street to All Chocolate Kitchen. Award-winning pastry chef Alan Roby has sculpted life-size creations entirely out of chocolate on display in his shop. Many award, uh, sorry, many have been featured in television shows on the Food Network, TLC, and Hallmark channels. Sculptures include Eros, the God of Love, a 23-foot-tall enchanted chocolate tree, 
the astronaut Neil Armstrong and the Jurassic dinosaur, both pictured here, Randy the blues player, and the pheasant. Chef Roby's latest creation, created from chocolate and sugar, stands over eight feet tall. Roby created it to spread a message of hope and love, saying together we will get through this challenging time in history and emerge stronger and hopefully even more grateful for each day for the gift of life. Moving over to the corner of South 2nd Street and State Streets, we see the Lincoln Highway mural. In 1913, the Lincoln Highway came through Geneva from the south on Route 31 and then west on Route 38. Later, the route was changed from Route 31 to 3rd Street because it interfered with the trolley car line. This mural is one of 35 across Illinois based on photographs taken between 1913 and 1928. It was funded by the Lincoln Highway Coalition in 2010. The image on the mural is of longtime Geneva policeman Reuben Anderson, seated on his motorcycle at the corner of 3rd and State Streets. As a tribute to the Masons, the Masonic symbol is hidden within the painting, which isn't really hidden if you know what it looks like. <laughs> Next, we'll go a few blocks east to the southeast corner of State and 4th Streets, just in front of Aurelio's Pizza to check out a unique cycle. This was the second artistic bike rack created for bike plus rack equals art, installed in 2016 by local artist Jim Jenkins. The piece is made of burnished steel. Jenkins spent 20 years in the manufacturing industry, which gave him an advanced knowledge of metal fabrications. He merges these skills with his creativity and artistry to create unique works of art. Of his works, Jenkins states, my sculptures provide a theme for both intellectual and visual curiosity. We will see more of his work later on. Now let's head to the home of the State Street Diner at 630 West State Street. The walls of this diner were painted by Geneva artist, Joseph Gonpen, to tell the history of Geneva, including a replica of the 1869 bird's eye view map, the train trestle over the Fox River, State Street with a trolley car and historic businesses, and a Viking profile to represent the mascot of the Geneva High School. Next, we'll move back to 3rd Street on the corner of South 3rd and Campbell Streets to see Welcome Rounds. This was the first artistic bike rack installed by the GCAC for their Bike Plus Rack Equals Art Initiative. It was created by Western Lambert, a professor of glass practice at Tulane University. As you can see, on a sunny day, the light reflects through the rounds to color the ground. Now we'll move over to the new Geneva Public Library at 227 South 7th Street. For more than 10 years, the Friends of the Geneva Public Library raised funds through the sale of books and from outright donations to purchase and erect a statue in the literary garden. In 2004, the sculpture was built. The sculpture portrays Nick Bottom, a character from Shakespeare's play A Midsummer Night's Dream, after the magical fairy Puck transformed his head into that of a donkey's. Bottom, who holds a book and stands on the axle of a wheel, is attended by two fairies. One, a female, sits, sits on his book and strokes his cheek. The other, a male, sits on the wheel and appears dejected. The bronze statue stands eight feet tall and weighs more than 500 pounds. It was sculpted by St. Charles artist Ray Cobalt. The statue was originally on display outside the old Geneva Public Library at 127 South James, or 127 James Street before being moved last week to their new location. Next, we'll go over to the side patio of Graham's Fine Chocolates and Ice Cream to see this nine foot metal statue. It was made by artist Joseph Gonpen in 2000. Notice how the face is created out of a Honda motorcycle engine cover and a computer keyboard acts as its back leg. According to his website, Joseph enjoys engaging in the task of creating something meaningful from society's refuse, and he works it into monumental works of art. He mimics living forms with inorganic matter, creating animals, insects, plants, and whimsical abstractions from what is essentially garbage. Just to the right of the horse is another Ganpan piece, the elephant. And just to the right of that is the iron gion, another piece and a similar, a similar sculpture to this one is for sale on his website. Our next stop is St. Mark's Episcopal Church at 320 Franklin Street. 
In 1919, Louis Grell, a prominent Chicago artist, was commissioned to create a large mural for the St. Mark's Chapel. He served in the same regiment as the Reverend at the time, Victor Hogue. Grell was an art teacher at the Art Institute of Chicago from 1916 to 1922. The mural, created from oil on canvas and attached to the wall, is named The Coming of the Holy Spirit as Pentecost, at Pentecost. It portrays the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the Apostles during the Feast of Weeks, as described in the Acts of the Apostles. In addition to the mural, Grell, with the assistance of a local Geneva craftsman, also painted two side archangels and placed stenciling throughout the church. Unfortunately, the two archangels were eventually painted over, but a clipping from the Chicago Tribune in the 1920s shows their placement on the sides of the altar in the chapel. I added this image to show the detailing at the top portion of the wall. Here we see the angels announcing and welcoming the Holy Spirit's descent. In 2018, fine art conservators of the Kune Berry Associates undertook the task of restoring the six panels of oil on canvas. They were able to lift decades of soil off of the canvas from the church's old coal furnace. The mural is one of Louis Grell's earliest known American church murals still in existence. Now we'll move back to Third Street to visit the Bicycle Lion just outside of Graham's 318 Coffee House. This lion, made out of bicycle parts, is another piece by Joseph Gonpen. The lion was recently updated by Grams to include a timely face mask across its snout. Now we'll move to 215 Fulton Street to see Daphne out of the Laurel Gone, just in front of Allen and Peppa Architects. This bronze sculpture was created by artist Jeff Adams and is based off of a character in Greek mythology. Daphne was a naiad nymph and famous for being incredibly beautiful and catching the eye of Apollo. However, Daphne was determined to remain unmarried. Daphne turned to the river god Peneus and pled for him to free her from Apollo. In response, Peneus turned Daphne into a laurel tree, which I'm sure is exactly what she wanted. Next, we'll move to 328 South, Street, South Third Street. This redwood carving of a rabbit on the Fulton Street side patio of the former paper merchant was created by an artist in California. Before opening this paper store, the owners visited similar businesses and got the idea to include the sculpture as a reference to the March Hare, who served as the personal messenger to the White King and through the looking glass. While the paper merchant will soon close, I have heard that the March Hare will remain in its current location. Moving a little down the road, let's go inside the Little Traveler. Starting in the 1940s, Kate Raftery, founder of the Little Traveler, commissioned young artist William Moulis to paint murals and decorative details throughout her store. At the time of their meeting, Moulis was a student at the Art Institute of Chicago. From 1947 to 1952, he kept an art studio in the Little Traveler. Moulis also created murals all over the world, including Paris, Bangkok, Hong Kong, and Morocco. His whimsical artwork can be seen throughout the Little Traveler on the ceiling of the lamp department, pictured here, above the windows of the shoe department, on the doors of the women's fitting rooms, and on the door of the women's restroom near the main staircase. In addition to murals, Moulis also designed and wrote many of the Little Traveler's early almanacs, such as the one pictured above. If you're interested in learning more about Moulis and the Little Traveler, check out the museum's 100th anniversary of the Little Traveler exhibition opening next year. Our next stop is the Robert B. Joshel Plaza at South Third and Crescent Streets. The plaza was named after Robert Joshel, who was the longtime owner and operator of Mid Valley Lumber Company, located at this site. Developer Kent Jodine gifted the sculpture to the city. It features a man holding an umbrella with his left hand outstretched, checking for rain. In warmer months, water will pour out from the top of the umbrella. The sculpture was created by San Francisco artist Miles Metzger. When asked what inspired him to create the sculpture, Metzger replied, I wanted to depict one of life's most common occurrences. We want something and when we finally get it, more than often we get more than we are needing. Things happen in cycles and feed off of each other. Hitting in baseball, making sales, popularity, catching fish, rain. When it rains, it pours. Next, we'll go down to the Kane County Government Center at 719 South Batavia Avenue. 
This memorial was dedicated on November 11th, 2004 to honor the King County service men and women who gave their life for their country during the 20th century. St. Charles artist Guy Belliver created the 14 foot citizen soldier without a helmet to portray him as a soldier returning to civilian life. Surrounding the pedestal are seven stations. Each station marks a conflict and bears a plaque with stati statistical data on the service men and women who served during them. Eighth grade students at Rotolo Middle School in Batavia created a virtual companion to the more memorial to provide and find more information about each of the veterans listed on the plaques. Just behind and to the south of the government center sits the grotto. The property the grotto sits on was once the county estate of Chicago and Merritt Cole, just after the Civil War. In 1925, the land was sold to the Society of Missionaries of the Sacred Heart Seminary. The grotto chapel was built between World War I and World War II out of local stone and was used for outdoor masses. Declining enrollment forced the sale of the property and it was purchased by King County in 1972 for a new government center. Mosaic rocks spread over three arches depict heaven and earth, a crucifix crossed by two swords, a chalice, and a lighthouse. Two phrases border the arches, ingnem veni miter, miter which translates to, I have come to bring fire, and ego sum lux mundi, or I am the light of the world. And I'm sorry for my Latin translation. <laughs> the grotto's upper corners are decorated with the Greek letters Alpha and Omega, referring to the New Testament, and the altar is inscribed with IHS, the first three letters of Jesus in Greek. Unfortunately, the IHS on the altar is no longer visible, as vandals and graffiti artists forced the caretakers of the grotto to paint over their work with white. Next, we'll check out the Fabian Eagle statues. Colonel George and Nell Fabian once lived on the 30-acre property known, now known as the Fabian Forest Preserve. They commissioned two large eagles with eight-foot wingspans to be sculpted, one on the island in the Fabian Forest Preserve in 1916, and one on the roof of Riverbank Laboratories at 512 Batavia Avenue in 1918. Both were created by Fabian's resident sculptor, Silvio Silvestri. The eagles the eagles decayed over the years and were recast by sculptor Annie Ravelstad in 1988 with funding by Friends of Fabian. Next, we'll go along the Fox River bike path at the east entrance of the Fabian Forest Preserve. Wrapped in a blanket and surrounded by a mound of natural rocks at its base, this Native American monument is said to be Blackhawk, a band leader and a warrior of the Sauk Native American tribe. In the early 1900s, Nell Fabian had this statue made as a tribute to her father, who was an Indian agent, or a person authorized to speak to Native American tribes on behalf of the government. Just in front of the Black Hawk statue is Bicycle Man. This metal sculpture depicts a man with a top hat riding a penny farthing bicycle. This was the first machine to be called a bicycle in the 1870s. The name comes from, a British, from the British penny and farthing coins one being much more larger than the other, so that the side view resembles a penny leading a farthing. Next, we'll head to 35 North River Lane, where inside the Riverside Receptions Courtyard sits the Howell Power Wheel. This piece was made from the wheel that was originally on the rooftop of this building and brought power from the Fox River to the Howell Foundry Company in the late 1800s. The wheel was preserved by the Chaudine family during renovations in the 1980s. Now we'll move over to River Park to check out the history wall. The stone terrace beginning at the south end of the amphitheater displays artifacts from different eras of history along the Fox River. Eras range from the prehistoric days of the ancient sea, the glacial drift, the first people, Geneva settlers, industry, and stewardship. This section shows a bit of the industry, showing little implements. And this next one shows a few sod irons, most likely created by the Howell Company. Also in River Park is Turtle Boulder. Local artist Jim Jenkins carved this piece along the river. The turtle often factors into Native American creation stories. When the world was covered with water, the lowly muskrat, snapping turtle, and otter all dove down to bring up the first gobs of earth. From this island of mud, often gathered on the turtle's back, the earth grew. Jenkins also designed the railing at River Park. 
showing dragonflies and the suggestion of ripples in the river's current. Now we'll move over to the east side of State Street Bridge to see the mill flower. Originally constructed in 1848 to make paper, the Bennett Mill was converted by Henry and Charles Bennett in 1865 to grind wheat from local farmers. By the late 1890s, the mill was turning out 160 barrels of flour a day. Government restrictions during war years and competition led to business decline and the mill shut its doors in the early 1950s. In 1971, the vacant mill burned to the ground in a mysterious fire. After the fire, 15 pieces of the mill's mechanical works were salvaged from the remains and used to create this 18-foot sculpture by Oak Park artist Geraldine McCullough, dedicated in 1979. Next, we'll head to Island Park. Just past the first walking bridge is the sesquicentennial sculpture. In 1985, Geneva artist Sally Ruark created this sculpture to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the city. Ruark was inspired by the trees on Island Park that have stood guard over the city during its 150 year history. Another tree that inspired her was the tree on the city flag, created by Neil McBain. She liked the tree so much, she decided to present it in another way by sculpting three oak trees in staggered sizes to signify the past, present, and the future, with the future being the largest tree. In the base is a time capsule that will be opened in 2035 to celebrate Geneva's bicentennial. The sculpture was donated by the Sesquicentennial Commission, the Geneva Park District, and the Geneva Rotary Club. On the sides of the Warlick Law Offices at 114 East State Street is the mural From the Field to the Table. This mural was created by Joseph Gonpen in 2003 when the Hanson Baking Company occupied the building. The artwork features scenes depicting field workers, baristas, winemakers, and bakers. Next, we'll stop at the Geneva High School at 415 McKinley. This sculpture is another work by Joseph Gonpen and represents the Viking School mascot. It was part of a gift from the class of 2013 to create the Geneva High School Viking Plaza. Our furthest stop takes us to Peck Farm Park at 4038 Caneville Road. In 2016, Geneva artist Larry Johnson was commissioned by the McBain family to create Prairie Girl for placement in the sensory gardens at Peck Farm Park. The statue was first conceived of by the McBain by the Mabane family on one of their many walks through the park shortly after the, their daughter Emma had passed away in her sleep in 2000, 2011. Their hope for the sculpture is that Emma will smile on Prairie Girl from her birth in the heavens. The Mabanes commissioned the work through their own nonprofit organization, the Starshine Galaxy Foundation. The statue is intended as a tribute to children, especially those who are no longer with it, with us. It was also partially funded by the Geneva Foundation for the Arts. And lastly, we'll take a look at some of the painted fire hydrants throughout Geneva. The Art on Fire program was initiated by the City of Geneva in 2013 with the assistance from its Cultural Arts Commission to showcase Geneva's artistic talent and bring art into the community. More than 80 hydrants have been adopted and painted by local artists. The city's Public Arts Committee, Advisory Committee, and Cultural Arts Commission judges the hydrants and awards prizes to the top three design winners every year. The City of Geneva's website has a list of every year's adopted fire hydrants, along with a map and images. So that is all I have for you today. If you enjoyed today's tour, please check out our historic walking tour. It is available for purchase at a PD, as a PDF in our online store at GenevaHistoryMuseum.org. You can also purchase a physical copy in our gift shop. Since the museum is not currently open to the public, though, we do ask that you call before you arrive to make sure someone's in. There will also be a revised public art tour available to purchase on our website within the next few weeks. I'll stop sharing my screen. And if anyone has any questions, oh, do we have a map of these locations? We will in the public art tour. Um, I mean, we do technically, but I want to update it a little bit more. Does anyone else have questions? Oh my God, I 
and start the video. Be in sync. No. All right then. Well, thank you for, oh, there's someone in the chat. Where are the chocolate statues? The chocolate statues are inside All Chocolate Kitchen. It's uh, 33 South 3rd Street. Um, all of the ones I listed are inside there. Enjoyed the program. Thank you, Jenny. Very nice of you. All right, well, if there's no more questions, I will let you go. Thank you for attending today's brown bag. It will be recorded, or it is recorded. Thanks, Emma. <laughs>